Well, let's get underway then. So, um, Kirsten Hunter, welcome to the show. Welcome to Too, uh, Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Super, super keen. You're a friend to uh, Athena already. You've already helped us with our brand and, and uh, culture and impact sessions. So, awesome to, to chat again. Before we jump into anything um, and hear about your background and what you're up to and so forth, we have a tradition at uh, Too Rare to Die where Wallo, my glorious co-host, will welcome you in with a song that he has prepared. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, have you been sung to before? By any- <laughs> Definitely not over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> From a from a random from a random stranger. Yeah, from a random stranger. <laughs> yeah. Well, the people who have sung to me before have tended to be random strangers, but not in a Zoom context. There you go. <laughs> yeah. oh, you feel good then. Yeah, I'll, I'll continue along that line. You know, be another <laughs> one. So yeah, let me let me uh, share some music with you. Um, great. Here we go. Uh. I will also share the lyrics just in case you'd like to follow along. So here we go. Share the lyrics. Sing along, um, sing along if you want. Yeah, yeah sing along if you want. <laughs> Made it very EDM, very happy. Yeah. He was my. He was my. He was more Better Because there ain't no one He was more A better, brighter life for all Won't take no Till everyone can stand on par She wants more She wants more she wants more, she wants more, Gustin Hunter, she wants more. Yeah, so apparently... Oh my gosh, that was the best. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we can easily fix that. <laughs> no, I love I stitched, it. I stitched you up I'm ready. Let's chat. That was the perfect mindset shift. <laughs> yes. Nice one. Nice yes, one, Wallo. Nice one. Yeah. Nice one, brother. Hey, um, Kirsten, would love to um, would love to hear a little bit about um, yeah, keen to jump into to what you're up to now and and what you spend your days doing. But before we do, tell us a little bit about your background. Where are you from? How is your upbringing? Tell us a little bit about Kirsten Hunter. Yeah, I mean, there's a few really big questions there. So, I guess I'll I'll try and give you a bit of an intro to me in a nutshell, and stop me at any time if I start going off track. But um, so I live in Australia. I have lived in Australia my whole life, except for sort of two years that I spent over in Canada. Um, and I grew up just sort of at the lower end of the Gold Coast, which is quite a you know like coastal kind of area. Uh, it's mm-hmm. called Tweed Heads for anyone who's sort of quite familiar with the northern New South Wales geography over here um, on the sovereign lands of the Bundjalung pe- people who were the First Nations um, people who looked after that land for millennia before uh, settler colonisers came to Australia, uh, which is my my origin. So I, I come mm-hmm. from sort of settler heritage. So mm-hmm. I grew up, you know, swimming, surf life saving, um, spending a lot of time outdoors and a lot of time kind of you know, doing things that had a really strong sense of community as well as a sort of strong impact on the community. Um, So I originally started, like after I finished school, I moved down to Sydney and originally was studying medicine because I I sort of thought I really want to do something that gives Mm -hmm. back. I want to do something Mm -hmm. that helps people and that sort of creates a stronger community. Um, But when I was at uni, I got really into volunteering and I got really involved in the student organisations on campus. And as part of that, I actually ended up getting elected to the board of directors of the UNSW union and, um, you know, found myself basically running a business at the age of 23. And I absolutely loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, And what I really loved about it was seeing how you could use 
a business, which was something mm-hmm. that I had very limited exposure to, but mm-hmm. use a business to create a sense of community for people who would benefit from that activity, as well mm-hmm. as how the business has an impact on the staff who work for it. And mm-hmm. um, in particular, we were going through a huge kind of regulatory change in the university sy- system at the time that resulted in my organisation, the union, um, losing a bunch of uh, a bunch of revenue because of changes in the way student fees were collected. And it meant that we actually were in a position where our staff who worked for the organisation had no certainty about what whether they would have a job, what that job would look like. And seeing mm-hmm. the impact that that uncertainty had on the people who, you know, showed up every day and put their heart and soul into building a community for the students who they served, I think really was foundational for me. And after after doing that role, I actually ended up switching out of medicine and transferring to law and Mm -hmm. changed the direction of my career to be more business oriented and in particular Mm -hmm. more kind of governance and people oriented through business. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Yeah. So uh, do you want me to keep going? Do you want to chat about that for a bit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have a, um, you have a. When you look at your LinkedIn and your background, and you know, so on and so forth, it's a funny. It's kind of like it seems to be more of a common pivot now in Australia. Uh, more people coming out of corporate into startup land, um, and a superannuation startup is kind of like a blend of both. And obviously, like a, it's not a full like it is startup, but um, but yeah, I would love to know kind of. Um, how you moved from a corporate background and studying law into obviously more the, the, the startup space and, and if that was a tough transition. I actually lived with um, a lawyer uh, before I moved in with my partner and he was, he, he actually, man, his day to day, he was so disenfranchised with law and just so unmotivated and just, and the culture at his firm was so shocking. And I was always trying to transition him like, hey, mate, there's so many awesome opportunities doing cool stuff that you'd be interested in and and wasn't able to get him across yet. But what was the, um, the transition from law to startup land like? Yeah, I mean, look, such a great question and something that so many people really struggle with, I think, is like mm-hmm. taking that mm-hmm. leap out of, you know, like, corporates, whether it's law or consulting or accounting or whatever it might be, you have a sense of certainty about what your life is Mm -hmm. going to be like. You know, you might not love it, but you're certain about what it's going to be. Whereas jumping out of that into startups is like taking a leap of faith that it might be better. Um, Mm -hmm. And so for me, like very much like that same kind of thing. So I I went from, you know, really passionate community oriented organization at university, absolutely Mm -hmm. loved that job, but Mm -hmm. it was a two year term. And so at the end of the two Mm -hmm. years, I had to find something else to do. Um, Studied law, found myself in one of the big law firms over here in Australia and um, realized pretty quickly that the practice of law, particularly as a junior lawyer in a big firm is very different to the theory of law when you're at university. Um, Mm -hmm. most notably it's a lot more photocopying. And so I found myself, you know, like (laughs) literally in the photocopy room at 3am some nights because, you know, like it's just the way the model works that your junior lawyers end up doing that kind of work, photocopying, putting things in order in a folder, replicating that 15 times for a lot of different counsel in the trial, you know, so Mm -hmm. not, not particularly thrilling work and not work that really makes you feel like you're having an impact with your life. Uh Um, Mm. I I moved across to management consulting and spent six years at Bain & Company because I wanted something that would allow me to feel, you know, like more more close to the problems I was solving, whereas law was quite a long way away. Um, But it was still a kind of similar thing. Like I loved my time at Bain. I loved the problem solving that I was doing Mm -hmm. there. But Mm -hmm. I still, at the end of the day, didn't really feel like the problems I was solving were having the kind of impact that I wanted to. Um, Mm -hmm. And both in my time in law and consulting, I kind of eased my corporate guilt by doing volunteering things on the side Uh so Uh I um I represented a claimant at the Aboriginal Trust Fund remuneration scheme and so I got to use my law skills to help someone recover stolen wages that their their Mm -hmm. parents had earned when they were children and so you know that was an amazing thing to be able to do as a junior lawyer um when I was at Bain I did some work with with Oz Harvest who are a charity operating in Australia and we helped them understand the social return on investment from the work that they were doing and um Mm -hmm. you know like just an incredible thing to be able to use problem solving consulting skills to be able to do. Um, But ultimately for me, uh, things started changing once I had my daughter and they changed for a couple of reasons. Firstly was I was trying to work part-time and parent 
uh, well, in the gaps left over, work part-time, parent full-time. Uh-huh. And I just didn't have, I didn't have the time to do volunteering anymore. And mm-hmm. without that kind of outlet, my energy for the corporate day job just started to grind down and down. And then yep. the second thing that changed was I started reading a lot more about climate change and I just had this realisation that, like, my daughter's going to be 26 years old in 2040. Um, Mm -hmm. that's the time when, you know, this was seven years ago, that was the time when there was forecast to be floods and wildfires and food shortages and no more coral Mm. reefs and just all of these sort of horrific apocalyptic um, events being forecast. Mm. And Mm. I just thought, you know, she's going to be 26, she's going to be a young woman, she's going to be living in this world, and here am I, someone who thinks that they are a community-oriented person who wants to have a career with impact, And I'm spending the, like, I'm dedicating my brain to helping companies make more money, probably at the expense of the world that she's going to live in when she's older. And so that was sort of the catalyst for me to start looking for something. Um, I I knew I didn't want to go work in a charity um, just because I think I couldn't, I couldn't dedicate myself to one single cause. And Mm -hmm. I found um, the charity sector you end up operating on really lean resources and a lot of your time is spent sort of trying to find more money. And so I was yeah. I was looking for something that was more purpose oriented that would combine like the hard corporate skills that I had with something mm-hmm. that had a real impact. And so I moved mm-hmm. across to a company called Super, uh, Future Super, which operates in the superannuation space in Australia and um, superannuation pension is sort of the other term in other sort yeah. of parts of the world. But basically mm-hmm. we we were the first company to provide Australians with an option to put their retirement savings in a fund that was completely fossil fuel free. There was nothing like that that existed in Australia in the time. And so you had all of these young people who were going to be putting their life savings in in superannuation funds that were investing their money in propping up the fossil fuel industry, which yeah. was going to mean that the world that those young people were retiring into was going to be, you know, basically what was described in those reports I was reading before. But, I mean, even still, even though I was able to find something that put my kind of core financial services skills into practice in a business environment that had a clear impact, it still felt really uncomfortable making that move from corporate. And, wow. you know, I had the thing about uh, about big corporates, I think, is like so much of the ecosystem is built around keeping you there. Like there's all mm-hmm. these social events. You build great relationships with your peers and colleagues. You have these amazing mentors and sponsors who help you find mm-hmm. your way through mm-hmm. the corporate pathway. Like you feel like you're on a stairway to something and stepping yeah. off that feels really confronting. Like I literally had a mentor say to me, you know, I before I can support you doing this, I need you to look me in the eye and tell me that this is the best thing for you to be leaving and doing. And I kind of thought about that and I was like, I don't need to look you in the eye at all. Like nah. this is You're like, I don't actually call. know if that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> this is a gut educated bet. Yeah, what I kind of realised is, um, you know, those businesses, whether they're consulting firms, accounting firms or, or law firms, um, once you leave, you provided you don't go out in a blaze of glory, you're actually not closing any doors. Like generally mm-hmm. they'll take you back. And so yeah. what I kind of realised is like, the lowest I can fall was where I was back then. Yeah. You know, maybe I yeah. get promoted six months later, you know, but at the end of the day, that's yeah. that's really the worst that's going to happen. And so it's all Certainly upside. not a bad fallback. Certainly, certainly it's not, not a bad, bad fallback. fallback. Exactly. <laughs> a law degree at yeah. one of the big four firms in, in, in Australia. Um, yeah, and even now, five years later, I'm pretty confident that if I went back to my old consulting firm or if not them, their competitors and said, hey, guys, I want to come back, that they'd take me back. So yeah. it really, it once you start thinking about it in that way, it really lowers the risk that is associated yeah. with making a move to a startup. And so then you're just kind of faced with how do I make this work economically for my household budget? How do I weigh up? Mm-hmm. You know the the implications of equity programs versus mm-hmm, bonus mm-hmm. programs that that you have mm-hmm. in corporates, and how do I find the thing that I want to put my energy into that's going to take yeah. me to this stage of my career? One hundred percent. That's the most important thing. That how do I find the the thing I want to put my time and effort into? Because it's all uh, it's all. I mean, if in an ideal world you could have your cake and eat it too, but you have to you have to risk something. You say, hey, this is something that I'm willing to sacrifice some security, some level of financial um, opportunity because I'm passionate about this project. I think if it goes well, I will have financial security, but it's going to get me out of bed and, and a spring in my step every day. That's the, 
that's the risk that you take, I guess. Um, mm. I've got a, um, a question on something you mentioned, just uh, an interesting point. Um, how do you think the landscape looks in terms of doing the best impact? Because you mentioned charities versus like non-for-profit versus for-profit business. Because... Yeah, I would love to understand how you think of charities in general because I kind of, I kind of, this sounds really rude when I'm about to say, I don't shake my head at charities, but I wish there was a way that charities could do more good because the way that you can do the most good is be a decacorn, $100 billion company who has an impactful business model. That's the way I look at it. I'm keen yeah. to hear your like opinion on charities versus for-profit, but better done capitalism, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, like totally agree. And not to take anything away from the work of charities and the people sure. who work for them, like they do for incredible sure. things and they do it mm -hmm. in a really resource constrained environment a lot of the time. Yeah. And they do it with societal barriers constantly chucked in their way. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, like for me, I think we have this artificial divide in capitalist societies between business and charity. And, you know, mm -hmm. the idea is business is over here and they operate in a, a capitalist system and they make money and then you donate mm -hmm. some of your profits for charity. But effectively, the charities are fixing the problems that the capitalist system has created. And so yeah. by having this separation, you make more problems for the charities and you also yeah. set up, I think, a, a less... I don't know, a less long-term sustainable environment. So mm -hmm. corporations that create these social inequalities that the charities then sort of operate to fix, but mm -hmm. really corporations that operate in a way that isn't in harmony with people and the planet are ultimately not going to be sustainable 100-year mm -hmm. businesses. Either you burn mm -hmm. out your people and you constantly have to sort of replace and renew your workforce or you mm -hmm. run out of resources that your business is consuming in order to generate its profits. And mm -hmm. I think similarly having a separation between the charity sector and the business sector means that so many charities are reinventing the wheel when it comes to things like recruitment practices, internal operations, like that and the fact that they have to spend so much of their time actually securing revenue to be able to run the programs that they do. And so mm -hmm. that sort of artificial divide between business and charity makes more problems than it solves. Yeah. And yeah. so for me, I think bringing them together makes so much sense. And whether you sort of, you know, I don't think the pathway is necessarily like fully for purpose business capitalist society with no charities at all. But I mm -hmm. do think if you if you if you're a business leader and you think really seriously about what is that responsibility to steward this business for the long term, you can't create a business model that doesn't operate in harmony with people and the planet. And so I think the new breed of purpose-driven corporations where the amount of positive impact that you have is directly linked to the product that you make, uh, to the to the profit that you make, I think that sets up a sustainable system that can keep renewing itself in perpetuity. And then if we have that as well, the problems for charities will be smaller. And I think mm -hmm. those kind of businesses mm -hmm. often come with, you know, 1% pledge or um, profit redirection into charitable mm -hmm. causes mm -hmm. that sets up a sustainable revenue source for charities that they can rely on. And it means that they can mm -hmm. spend more of their people time solving problems instead of getting money. Yeah, for sure. That's um, the dream, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We interviewed Simon from Who Gives a Crap uh, a few episodes ago. Um and that was an amazing uh, story. I remember thinking of, like, I find it very inspiring. We, we, we have, well, I say we, myself, um, I look at really the two companies that I look at most are Patagonia globally, but who gives a crap locally? So I was like, super awesome. I've gotten to know Simon a little bit now and it was really cool to, to, to chat to him the other day. But who gives a crap's model just really just makes me smile when I think about it because it's, it's, a new way to do capitalism. It's a yeah. for yeah. it's a for profit company. But how much profit do you need? Okay, like okay, well, we're going to divert fifty percent, and it was built from from day one. It's it's amazing, and it's also um, th this this benefit hopefully won't be around forever. But I was at one point thinking of before we had our session last year. It was probably like six months prior. I was thinking of different ways that Athena could like build impact into its business model, and. I pulled out my um, notepad and I wrote down who gives a crap's model. And then I wrote down all the little things that having an impact-driven business model would improve. So I, I wrote down employee retention, 
um, charging higher prices, higher NPS, longer, cus- longer lifetime value of the customer. Oh, there was like eight little intangibles. And if you tweak them all, I think I tweaked them all by, I said, I did real back of the napkin stuff, million dollars in revenue, tweak X, Y, and Z, or all by 1% or like 2 3%. And I thought to myself, I think who gives a crap are a much more robust, and I mean robust by making money financially, bottom line, much more mm. robust company than they would have been had they not been giving 50% of their profits to charity. And look, they're more robust because they're the exception to the rule. And hopefully at some point, they're not the exception to the rule. And these, these benefits no longer exist. But if that's the case, then we're all living in a much better world and you know, we win. You know, it's, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree because it's sort of like it's such an amazing business because it's so simple, you know, like it, it's mm-hmm. it's a commodity product, toilet paper, but mm-hmm. how do you get mm-hmm. people to talk about toilet paper? How do you get them to care about it? It's not by making better squares or, you know, like that's some of that, but it's not Seven a lot ply. of that. It's the other stuff, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. it's the reason yeah. for it. And, I mean, even right from the beginning, Who Gives a Crap came out with, like, super fun patterns on their toilet mm-hmm. paper. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. it became mm-hmm. a status symbol to mm-hmm. buy from Who Gives a Crap, to have your toilet paper on display mm-hmm. in your mm-hmm. bathroom when people came mm-hmm. over. And then on top of that, the action backs up the marketing messages, you know, like mm-hmm. the amount of yeah. money that they have given to charity last year or the year before, I guess, now when when COVID took off and, you know, <laughs> And I think had something that was like, <laughs> what a great time to be in the toilet paper business. Who would have ever thought that would be a, a exactly. statement? <laughs> but, you know, like yeah, they gave yeah, like yeah. literally millions of dollars to charity yeah. off the back of that. Like incredible. It would have been so easy for them to sort of, you know, for, for someone who has a profit motive running that business oh, to yeah. sort of say, oh, well, you know, instead of sticking to our commitment around um, the percentage of profits that we donate, mm-hmm. like, you know, it's going to be too big a number. Let's just donate yeah, less. Yeah. It'll still be a big number, but but yeah. they did it. And, you know, yeah. that's so meaningful to consumers who are used to yeah. seeing greenwashing and marketing messages yeah. and companies trying to win them over on sustainability messages where the actions don't back up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I, I've i been super obsessed with brand and culture since day one at Athena. Everybody that's been here since day one, while I've been with us for nearly since day one or very, very early days anyway that, that would have heard Maybe me talk two. about brandon yeah yeah definitely <laughs> day two yeah um but it, it's um i i think uh, to create a good brand you really need to have like we did a um breakout with some of our new hires the other day i do a brand session and we talk about the brand and we've got a really pretty brand now it's really like amazing key visual color palette fonts and typography all that stuff it all it's all amazing but that's like when i talk about our brand session i talk about that as the tip of the iceberg like that's Mm. just the stuff that you see like here's why we exist here's all the real reason why the things that we're trying to achieve and and i think it's pretty easy to create a pretty nice brand these days but i feel like more so than ever consumers can see through it and they want to see like okay cool yeah like it's it looks nice but do you actually say the things you want to do or do you do, do you say anything at all do you exist for a reason or is and and this is another question i had for you like Because I know that you're close with our mutual friend, Sean Marsh, um, and he made me think of this question, but like how important is storytelling to social impact? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think storytelling, <clears throat> excuse me, I think storytelling is is key and, you know, like same same thing with who gives a crap as it was for us when we we're at Future Super trying to sell superannuation. Like, you know, we, people don't, people don't buy toilet people don't talk about toilet paper because of the yeah. product they talk about yeah. toilet paper because of what the product makes them feel mm-hmm. um and same thing for us like we found at future super we were trying to sell retirement a retirement savings product for mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. people and to climate conscious people who you know typically are under 35 and so therefore mm-hmm. typically don't want to think about retirement until they're at least 20 years older than there are now probably yeah. more um uh-huh. but like, and also financial services has this added complexity to it where people don't like talking about financial services products to their friends because they don't want to feel stupid if their friend mm-hmm. asks them something about fees or returns or investment philosophy or all those sort mm-hmm. of complicated financial services things that no one outside of the industry really understands. So how do you make people talk about superannuation and how do you get them to understand it in a way that 
you know, that they can talk about it beyond the the superannuation product itself. And that's that's the story. It's the, mm -hmm. you know, our product was not just a savings product. It was uh, bringing, it was creating an opportunity for people to use their financial power, for people to pull together and use their financial power. So, you mm -hmm. know, we operated at the intersection of financial power and people power. There's $3 trillion in the Australian superannuation system. If all of us band together, that means we collectively have more, like more money and in a capitalist mm -hmm. society, therefore more influence than, you know, the richest people in this country, than Gina Reinhardt, yeah. who's out there lobbying yeah. against changes that damage the mining industry. You know, we as consumers can pull our resources together and play in that capitalist game. And I think that's a really powerful, like a really yeah. powerful realisation for young people that this is not just something that matters to me when I'm 60. This is something that yeah. I can do right now and I can align my savings and my values with my um, my my beliefs and my politics. Yeah. Tell you what, Future Super is so similar to Who Gives a Crap. In I'm looking at the website now. I was looking at it uh, prior to the show. And the branding and storytelling and, and so forth, it's it's very similar in terms of it made it, it's making superannuation cool. You know what I mean? Right? Like making mm. toilet paper cool, koala made mattresses cool, you know, stuff like that. Um, but it's awesome on the on the website because it, it shows one um, image, and I know you're not there anymore, so I'm not sure you know how quick how often you check the website. But it shows um, you know in terms of making an impact into sustainability, recycling will uh, offset 0.23 tons of emissions. Being vegan is 0 0.08 tons. Living car free 3.5 tons, and then investing in future super, switching your super to a um, a sustainable super fund 5.89 tons yeah and it's just it's just it's just awesome <clears throat> i really believe in that the, the the power of storytelling i remember i read the sixth extinction uh a few mm. years ago and it totally changed totally changed like that moment for you that you said when you when you um looked at your daughter and you thought oh my god i'm bringing her into this world and we're the caretakers of this place like storytelling for me is key that's what i love about what you were able to do at future super um in a number of things like the um the not business as usual campaign um i mean that was awesome that was so inspirational to see um mm. so yeah 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 i mean the cool thing about that as well and you know like again it does really link to who gives a crap and you know like i i sort of became aware of who gives a crap back in the super super early days when simon sat mm -hmm. on a toilet for 50 hours to <laughs> raise the money to be able to get the business off the ground so you know they've definitely been a really strong influence on me in my business mm -hmm. leadership um mm -hmm. but you know like that that campaign the not business as usual campaign um where like typically what had happened previously um, when business supported the school students in their strike for climate was that they saw it as an opportunity to get access to the school student and associated market. Whereas mm -hmm. what we did that was different in that campaign was we sort of said like, we're not here to flog a product to these young people. What can mm -hmm. we do that adds to their cause? And by adding to mm -hmm. their cause, you know, like you trust the fact that they will see that action and, understand that we are the business we say we are you know mm -hmm, we are trusting mm -hmm. in the power of the brand and the power of the story to put mm -hmm. action behind our words even if it doesn't lead to a direct conversion of you know of members out of that event yeah so, so we sort of said like as business leaders we can speak to other business leaders and we can use that position to support the school students in their strike for climate strikes happening on a friday afternoon we know that the number one reason my, why most adults won't attend that strike even though they they might support the cause is because they have commitments at work. So what can we do as business leaders to, to change that situation? Um, we called on other businesses to join us and allow their staff to take time out of the workday to support the school students in their strikes. Um, Atlassian jumped on board super early. Mike Cannon-Brooks was a huge supporter. Um, mm -hmm. We thought maybe we'd get 20 businesses. We thought the fact that Mike Cannon-Brooks was wow. supporting it would mean that we'd get a bit of media. Uh, we yeah. ended up getting 3,500 businesses and Ooh. we ended up having... 
you know, uh, around 150,000 people, I think, who were able to attend those strikes because because of the work that we had done. Um, Mm -hmm. The financial, the Australian Financial Review, which is not known for its um, progressive politics or its support for, you know, climate causes, came out the day after those strikes and said that because of our campaign to get business leaders to give their staff time off, the numbers in those strikes were actually doubled across Australia was their estimate. So... The work that we did led to the biggest strikes in um, in Australia's sort of climate movement history. Uh, unfortunately, then COVID came in, and so we weren't able to follow that up with a lot of momentum yeah. afterwards. But mm-hmm. it was a real moment where I think a lot of business leaders, you know, three and a half thousand businesses who signed on, a lot of them hadn't kind of made that connection before that their role mm-hmm. as business leaders actually isn't divorced from their role as parents and members of the community and their staff yeah. aren't just employees they also care about these things and I've seen a real change in the dialogue within business leaders around like not necessarily kind of supporting political causes with their brand but that kind of mm-hmm. openness that being able to be involved in something that matters to you is a great thing to give your staff the opportunity to do you know and yeah, to to make to sure. make those opportunities available for people 100% but really, it's the frog in boiling water scenario is where we find ourselves. So it's going to be, it's not, I feel like that um, even hesitant business owners are going to be opening up opportunities for us to do more really because of necessity. I mean, we're getting to the point now where everybody's starting. You mentioned before we started recording, we're talking about the floods, floods in Brisbane. Obviously, it's like, it's, I mean, it's going to continue to, we're way behind where we need to be in terms of sustainability and in terms of um, the temp- keeping the temperature to 1.5 degrees. So it's going to continue to get worse and worse. People, everybody's going to be forced to act. It's probably, mm. I feel like it would have been much nicer if we had all have put our heads together and, and okay, guys, let's all go and um, do what we need to do. But, but now it'll be forced upon us, I feel, but that's... It is what it is. Hey, um, look, with your time at Future Super, um, what were some highlights in your time there? Because I know you've moved on since, but like you must look back on it super fondly. Like what were some things that um, bring a fond memory to your eye or, or, or fond memory to your eye? Man, it's, uh, <laughs> it's 9.30 over here. It's 9.30 p.m. Uh, can you give me a break? <laughs> but uh, what are the things you look back on most fondly and like are most proud of? Kirsten? Yeah, ooh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, not business as usual campaign. I think that that will continue to be a career highlight for me, just being able to cool. play a role in that awakening of business leaders to their responsibility as members of the community and to see the level mm-hmm. of support within the business community for the school students. Um, I mean, on top of that, I got to do a bunch of cool stuff. Like I, you know, was on ABC News talking about school strikes for climate. I was interviewed by international media publications. Like it was a really cool time where we got to, you know, we we got to be a part of the conversation. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that I'm most proud of at the time at Future Super, you know, it comes back to that question of storytelling, but we did mm-hmm. a lot of work around um, how we think about our role as a business and the role of the, you know, the the business that we, op- the community that our business operated in more broadly, including mm-hmm. sort of our members, the companies we invested in. Um, how can we tell that story in a way that's really compelling and easy to understand? Um, <clears throat> and how can we sort of position ourselves not just as, you know, a standalone business, not just as a representative of, you know, ethical investing businesses, but how Uh can we actually position ourselves as a spokesperson for the superannuation industry? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, our sort of view was we can do some things over here in our tiny little superannuation startup, but the real impact is going to happen if we can move the industry. So what are the Mm, points of leverage that we can play with that will influence the way the industry thinks and acts? Because Mm -hmm. um, we did some research around uh, the amount, you know, I said before, $3 trillion in superannuation. Um, Less than 8% of that is what it would cost to transition Australia to a fully renewable energy-powered 
um, economy. And so, you know, we we had no ambition to get to, I mean, we would love to get to 8% ourselves, but in a very, very big um, market, that would be near impossible. But mm-hmm. if we can lead the charge and get to 8% with other superannuation funds investing in renewables, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden we're making big impact. Um, and so another thing that we did that was also, I thought, really like a real highlight for me was we played a really big role as a spokesperson for um, the response that superannuation has uh, to provide for its members in their retirement during the COVID um, COVID lockdown, the first lockdown in Australia, where mm-hmm. the government, um, instead of sort of providing a package of economic support to people who were impacted by COVID, they gave people in Australia the opportunity to ret- withdraw their retirement savings early, um, which, you know, has a really, really big potential detrimental impact on people's long-term um ability mm-hmm. to retire securely, particularly for more, more vulnerable people, particularly for people with low balances, for women who mm-hmm. were more likely mm-hmm. to have to take time out of the workforce during COVID to care for children who they were sort of in lockdown with. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. we played a really um, a really strong role speaking about the the ethics and the impact of using superannuation um, to to in in during a public health emergency. Um, And so, like, I really loved the opportunity to use our kind of small, deliberate, thoughtful, purpose-driven business to speak on these national issues and to have a voice on things that impacted across the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, for me, like, as as you sort of alluded to, like, I actually left Future Super a year ago um, and and, am in a new role at a business called Bright, which is a business that finances Australian households, Australian at the moment households, to be able to sort of make their homes more sustainable. And again, so much of that comes down to the power of storytelling and the power of Mm -hmm. um, providing a simple way for people to be able to take action that lines up with their values. Like absolutely hands down, the biggest thing that needs to happen in order to stop global warming and stop us getting above one and a half degrees is for governments to take action to regulate the use of fossil fuels and put standards in place for industry like hands down that's the number one Mm -hmm. thing that needs to happen but that's Mm -hmm. not going to happen without the community pushing for that to happen government follows the people it doesn't lead the people in the way it works today and Mm so um our focus is on enabling households to take that action themselves both to sort of have their own uh, household impact on mm-hmm. emissions and on the the pathway that we're on, sort of good or bad, but mm-hmm. also to sort of build this movement of consumers who are investing in sustainability, who will, by virtue of, um, you know, by virtue of taking that action, they will force the government to act. And so, you know, 40% of emissions in Australia, give or take, comes from households. And there mm-hmm. are three things that households can do to have a, a real impact. They can switch their vehicles, so move to an electric vehicle rather than a sort of uh, fossil fuel powered vehicle. I mean, there are knock on arguments there. Where does your mm-hmm. electricity mm-hmm. come from? So, but mm-hmm. step one, uh, change your mm-hmm. vehicle. Step two, change your source of electricity. So move it from being coal-powered grid to um, solar power on your rooftop. And then Mm -hmm, step three, change how you use electricity in the home. So move away from gas-powered appliances to electric appliances, household efficiency. And if we can help Australian households do those three things, that's going to have a massive impact on the, um, the total emissions that are coming out of Australia. And it's going to empower households to speak more about climate issues because, you know, I can say from personal experience, once you have solar panels on your roof, you learn a lot about energy usage, about mm-hmm. how energy is produced, how to yes, operate yeah. household in a way, you know, like it's a rabbit mm-hmm. hole once you get it and you start looking mm-hmm. into the data. So, you know, the more mm-hmm. we can allow households to take that simple first step, the more it kind of builds an empowered consumer movement who are interested in sustainability and who will put pressure on their local members and governments and other businesses to take steps in that direction as well. Yeah. Mm. And look, if you have a young consumer who's uh, mid-20s, for example, who has started thinking about their impact and their sustainability, their personal sustainability and the choices that they make, and they've signed up to Future Super as their superannuation fund, for example, and then they've just invested in their first home, amazing, what a, what a success. And they've now, they're working with Bright and they have solar panels and electric car and so on and so forth. You're through storytelling and through building amazing brands, 
through capitalism really in a way um you've been able to change the consumer decision making and i think if people are already thinking about one or two of these steps then they're going to be thinking about other ways that they can it's like a flow on effect it's like oh this is me now this is what i do mm. now i think about this yeah. now this is how i need to think now um mm. and i think that's super important as well so making the ease because um we were doing a little bit of research um for our climate product that we have at Athena, this is about a year and a half ago, um, we we're doing some user interviews and everything that came back in the user interviews, the main takeaway, the through line between, we, we, we did five, we only did five interviews, but in all five interviews, the main uh, one through line was, I really, really want to make an impact, but I feel like it's going to be hard and I don't know where to start. So yeah. building these, these brands that are uh, really great at storytelling, really good user experience, really community and customer centric, takes away that issue and then starts to open up many more doors for people to, to, to yeah. think and act in, in more sustainable ways. So super mm. awesome. I'm really yeah, excited to understand exactly what's right. next for you as well. You know, <laughs> well you're like, you're, you're, you your career that. so far is like, it's very cool in terms of like uh, future super leads onto bright and, and then it's like, I don't know. I mean, you might be bright for the next 10 years. You might be bright for the rest of your career, who knows? But, but it's like a nice, it makes sense so far your career makes a lot of sense and it's like yeah. it always makes to... sense in hindsight mm. yeah, it yeah, yeah. The yeah. Time. <laughs> yeah yeah for sure for sure yeah yeah and look i don't know you know like uh i i do a fair bit of sort of mentoring and coaching within the startup ecosystem like i'm part mm -hmm. of the the giants program that blackbird operates uh -huh. Um, I, we, we at Bright also support Startmate and the fellowship programs that they run to help people move from corporate roles into, um, into cool jobs in trendy startups. But I think for me, you know, like when, when I was in between roles after I left Future Super and I was thinking about what, what came next before I even, you know, had thought of Bright as an option, um, I really thought about like what, what are the drivers for me? Um, what am I good at? What am I excited about? And I kind of came up with this like Venn diagram, which had, you know, three, three different bubbles. There was a financial services bubble. I know I'm good at that. Um, mm -hmm. There was a purpose-driven business bubble. Like I know mm -hmm. that's something that really energizes me. And then there was a startup bubble where it's kind of like, I know I really thrive in the, the chaos of startups. And I love the fact uh -huh. that every day is something different. And I know that I'm always working on the work that's highest priority because there's, you know, a pile this big of things I can do and a pile this big of things that I will be able to do. So, uh -huh, you know, yeah. you pick the most important things from the pile and it's it's a cool feeling to know that you're working on stuff that is the most important rather than, you know, being delegated photocopying till 3am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so when I was in discovery around what my next role would be, I kind of used that as a bit of a map and I, I reached out to my network. I had a bunch of conversations and I basically wasn't looking for a role. I was looking for something that would spark my energy. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I spoke to uh, traditional financial services players. I, I talked about what would it look like for them to move more towards fossil fuel free investing? You know, is there an opportunity for me to come in and help develop a new fossil fuel product? Or, you know, are they looking to take serious steps in the direction of um, reducing their climate impact that I can come in and, you know, like lend my brand and credibility that I've built up in that space and help them take mm -hmm. those steps in a material way? Mm -hmm. uh, would I look at other businesses that are, you know, like B Corp businesses? I mean, who gives a crap? Patagonia, Ben and Jerry's, you know, ones mm -hmm. that we've looked at before. Would I look to try and play a role in a an existing business that already operates in the purpose space? Or would I try and find another startup that I wanted to put my energy into? And, you know, then there's overlaps in that as well. There's startup uh -huh. fintech, startup purpose-driven businesses, <clears throat> purpose-driven fintechs, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, I just kind of use that to explore and, you know, I'm in a very privileged position that I had a bit of savings that I could use to take the time. I didn't have to rush into a job. So I totally acknowledge mm -hmm. that that's something that not everyone has the luxury of being able to do. Um, but yeah. it did allow me time to explore. So what's next for me? I mean, I don't, I don't have a plan. I'm guided by my energy and where I think I can have the most impact. Um, my role at Bright today is across people risk legal corporate affairs and program management so mm -hmm. it's a really broad role that allows plenty, me to plenty have still to do 
Yeah, plenty <laughs> still to do. Um, allows yeah, me to have yeah, a really yeah. big impact on how the company grows and how it how it tells its story sure. and where we focus on. So, at the moment, I'm really loving the challenge and having moved from CEO at Future Super to um, you know an executive role at Bright, it's really nice to have the opportunity to kind of focus in on developing my skills for a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But what's next? I don't know. I'm here for a little yeah, while yeah. yet. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, no, for sure. Like, and I'm the kind of person that while I'm learning and while that learning is directed to things that have an impact and while that impact aligns with, you know, the the story that I want to be able to tell about the role that I've played in the world, um, mm-hmm. then I'm happy. And I also do, you know, I'm involved in, um, I'm on the board of the Ocean Impact Organisation, which is um, looking to build a startup ecosystem to support um, businesses that have an impact on ocean health. Um, and so I do things like that as well to just like, give me that variety in what I want to do and to feel like I'm sort of, you know, sharing, sharing what I've learned over my last few roles in a way that can sort of, you know, help other people get their business ideas off the ground. Awesome. Um, what are some of the things that excite you in like uh, impact driven startups and s- sustainability? I, I for one have a real, um, a real soft spot for cultured meat. I think it's just the most amazing technology that will really make a huge impact in the future. You know, people are talking about artificial, uh, artificial in- intelligence and the metaverse and all these technologies that are way flashier and fancier. But in terms of like the metaverse for me is not fixing a problem that we have. In the, it's not fixing. Yeah. If, you, if, if something is, if you, the, the old adage of you get paid in, in relation to the size of the problem that you solve, well, people that are building the metaverse, as much as it's nice and cool and, and interesting, shouldn't get paid a dollar because it's not fixing a problem. So like, yeah. but when you think of clean meat and cultured meat, that really excites me, the, the impact that it'll have on the world um, yeah. in a multitude of ways. But is there, I mean, you're pretty connected startup wise and obviously, like you said, with the mentoring, is there anything in particular that you see in the world at the moment that just like gets you excited? Um, I mean, look, lots of things for, for me, because, because I think I grew up outside of like the big city center and, you know, I didn't grow up in a family that, um, you know, is heavily corporate, has heaps of money, any Uh of that kind of stuff. Like my parents run a Uh swimming pool, you know, Uh they, they're, they're community people. And I think, um, we're only going to save the world if we can take those people with us, you know, like we're not going to save the world with the kind of the people who have the money to be able to pay for expensive things. Like early adopters have a role to play, but we can't do it ourselves. And so I get really excited about what are the opportunities to do things that are going to change behaviour in the mass market, you know, going to make it easy Mm -hmm. for people who, you know, are making for whom this isn't the major driver in what they're going to do. How can we make it easy for those people to make decisions that have a much more positive impact on the world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think um, I've been some combination of vegetarian or vegan for the last four years. So super excited Mm -hmm. about cultured meats and um, the new generation of plant-based meat replacements because Mm -hmm. they enable, you know, they enable people that I grew up with, like my parents to make more informed choices that have a, a better impact on the environment. Like I think those kind of things where you can shift the behaviour of the community at large have the potential to have a massive, massive impact. Um, I really like a lot of the stuff that's happening around, um, you know, soldier flies and how we take mm-hmm. food waste and convert that into not just break it down but convert it into something that's usable and can go, go f- sort of, have other impacts within the supply chain. Um, That's another one. When- another, another one of our past guests, actually. While Walo yeah. wrote his his <laughs> catchiest riff um, to <laughs> um, to the body uh, to, for the body purpose, really. Um, yeah. With our, our earlier show, so um, yeah, super super crazy um, way in yeah. which they've and- built that built that startup. Yeah. And, you know, there's a few people sort of playing in that space now, whether it's kind of household focused or industrial focused. And I just think like it's a massive problem that needs to be solved and they've been able to come up with a really elegant solution. Um, we uh, we were um, 
at Future Super, I got to know Olympia Yaga, who's the founder of GoTerra. Um, mm-hmm. they, we shared investors and some of the stories, you know, like when you're a SaaS business in software development, like, you know, fast failure, all that kind of thing, things go wrong mm-hmm. and, you know, like mm-hmm. whatever, you you get a break, you get a glitch in your code and it doesn't work. But things go wrong when you're working with black soldier fly larvae and you have like <laughs> maggots all over your room, you know, like it's a different yeah. scale of that impact. stuff really of, going wrong. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's not like... It's not like it's a major thing. It's like, oh, we had a 0.1 degree of temperature difference in the room at the mm-hmm. time when we put the feed in and it was just like, mm-hmm. boom, maggots everywhere, you know. And oh so I God. just think that's such a fascinating um, fascinating sort of intersection between like the startup test and learn mentality and like the biological reality of working with insects. Yeah. Definition of um, definition of bug fixing or bug cleaning up, exactly. cleaning up bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Hey, um, I've got a um, one question before I want to throw it over to Walla, who has a few to, to finish us off. A few rapid fire questions. I want to um, yeah. I want to know. You obviously take your career very seriously, and, and I know that you think about sustainability a lot. So you can answer this question in uh, a couple of different ways. But I want you to tell me of the future that you want to see in five to ten years, the world that you're living in, and maybe the you know the impact that you've been able to have. What do you see as what do, you, what do you want to see in the future? Yeah, for sure. I mean, a couple of things like I, you know, the five to 10 year time frame is not, not actually a very long time. One of the mm-hmm. big changes that I'd really like to see come through and play a role in influencing is for business leaders to really take sustainability seriously. Um, and when I talk about sustainability, I don't just mean environmental sustainability, although that's very important, but sustainability of how they treat their staff and how, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. um, work-life balance and healthy work practices. Yeah sustainability in the resources that they extract to um, to run their business and build their products um, and sustainability yeah. in terms of the time frame of how they think about their business life cycle. So not just thinking mm-hmm. about how do we maximise total shareholder returns over the next quarter, but how do we build a 100-year business that's going to be around um, in, perpetuity, in mm. perpetuity and how, how mm-hmm. do business leaders steward that change? Um, and then the other thing I would really love to see, um, real leadership in politics. And I don't mm-hmm. quite know how <laughs> what how I have impact on that, but you know, I think for too long you need to get in um, there. You need to get in there, yeah. Kirsten. Yeah, well, <laughs> that might be the me, next role at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't see it happening, but um, you know, like I think <laughs> Fair enough. for too long, government has been driven by polls, and that means they're mm-hmm. following public opinion rather than leading public opinion. And mm-hmm. what we need right now to get through this climate crisis is political leadership, and we need mm-hmm. um, politicians who are willing to make make unpopular decisions and educate yeah. the public about why they are the right thing to do anyway. I think if uh-huh. those two things happen, we're on a pretty pretty good pathway. Um, and if those two things happen as well, then it makes it easier for everyday people to feel connected to the outcomes of the community instead of feeling like mm-hmm. it's all on me and I need to look mm-hmm. after my patch first. We can mm-hmm. move to more of a model where, well, yes, I need to look at my patch first, but I'm willing to make these daily sacrifices for the good of, you know, good of my neighbours and good of the rest mm-hmm. of the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. Sounds like a great future. Over to you, Wallo. Okay, okay. Uh, my first question is, what is your favourite book of all time? I decided to be just put myself on mute too. Ooh, favourite book of all time. There's so many. Yeah. Um, my favorite book of all time at the moment yeah. is Sand Talk by Tyson Yunka Porter, who is a First Nation man in Australia. And okay. what's, what's super interesting about this book is, you know, there's a lot that's been written examining um, First Nation cultures through a Western lens. Uh, but what yeah. he does is he examines Western culture through a First Nations lens. Mm. And it's just it's a fascinating flip on the way you expect uh, that story to play out and a beautiful intersection of sort of traditional storytelling and song lines and carving with how to think about um, that examination. So definitely recommend it. Yeah. He seems to really like sociology. I love that. Sounds really good. Super interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. What is, yeah, I love sociology as well. What is one tool that you can't live without? 
I can give you a reference if you want. Though. We have like we have a bunch of crazy references. There's one I like to bring up. The one where someone said their best tool was breakfast. So like, go wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do love breakfast. Best tool that I can't live without. I mean, like my phone and my laptop are the tools of my trade. So I think yeah. I would I would find it hard to do my job and have the kind of impact yeah. that I have within a sustainable way. You know, like I love the fact that we are speaking and each of us are in our homes in yeah. different parts of yeah. the world. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think those two things allow me to do a lot of the things that I really enjoy and have a lot of impact through. I love that. Yeah, screens screens have changed everything for us. Um, <laughs> so my final question before I throw it back to Doc is, so say you met this young entrepreneur trying to, you know, build a business or work, move along the lines of sustainability and social entrepreneurship. What's some piece of advice you would give them about tackling this, uh, dealing with it and making it a successful business that actually does what they say, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest piece of advice I could give young entrepreneurs is like, actually, no one's got this all figured out. Like, we're all just making it up as we go along. So if you don't, you know, don't feel like just because you're starting out that you you need to spend, you know, you you don't know as much or you're not as um, not as mm. capable as people who've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Um, I And I like to flip that around. Like, if you're a young entrepreneur who's just starting out, um, use the fact that you aren't trapped by the rules of the current system to challenge yeah. those rules and find a way yeah. around them. Um, and yeah. then the second piece of advice I think is just like ask lots of questions, you know, yeah. reach out to people you admire, reach out to people who have done it before, ask lots of questions and um, be willing to um, be willing to take up other people's time. Mm. <laughs> I love that last line. I'm taking the advice personally. So, yeah, Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a super a young entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, that's right. While I was, yeah, while I was, uh, while an entrepreneur yeah. in waiting, we've just he, he's he's already spilled the spilled the beans on his <laughs> it's a sustainable startup, impact driven startup that he's obsessed with. Maybe you can um, use right Kir- use Kirsten's use Kirsten's advice against her in the future. While <laughs> yes, I think that's right. definitely, yeah. definitely yeah. we turn that on her. Yes. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> anytime. Yeah, yeah good awesome. stuff. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Good stuff. So let me throw it back um, to Doc. Cheers, cheers, brother. Um, yeah. So, Kirsten, thanks for thanks for um, coming on the show. Super awesome to talk to you and, and hear your story and all the stuff you've achieved. Um, for people that want to follow along, people that want to reach out in any way, where can people find out more about you, more about Future Super, more about Bright, anything you want to talk about? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, um, Bright is bright.com.au. That's bright with an E, B-R-I-G-H-T-E dot com dot A-U. Uh, I, I mean, I don't have a big sort of thing for me. I'm on LinkedIn. I publish my stuff through there. So, um, you know, linkedin.com forward slash Kirsten Hunter. Uh, yeah. Future Super is futuresuper.com.au. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a like a big media team and a strategy when it comes <laughs> yeah. to this kind of stuff. I just like no, no, something annoys right. me and I write about it on LinkedIn. <laughs> Sounds like you're the Kirsten Hunter on LinkedIn though. LinkedIn.com yeah. yeah. forward slash Kirsten Hunter. Not Kirsten yeah. Hunter, not Kirsten Hunter with 999. <laughs> The Kirsten Hunter on LinkedIn. So Absolutely. that's that's at yeah, least something that's good. I got in really quick when they were allowing <laughs> yeah. us to put names. Yeah, you must have been. You must have been waiting at the keyboard. Yeah, <laughs> pretty um, much. Set an alarm. Right. Get up at two a.m. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, look again. Thank you so much. Um, that's pretty much it from our end, and um, that's a wrap.